Good evening, everyone. My name is Elian Ramos. I'm ER Geek Goddess. And tonight we're going to talk about a topic that is no laughing matter. Uh, the, as a matter of fact, this is the second largest criminal activity in the world. And it claims um, every year around 27 million victims worldwide. I'm talking about, of course, human trafficking. And um, to discuss this this topic that, um, you know, in, in reality, this is a topic that we always think happens somewhere else in some remote place. But the reality is that it's really happening right here, right now in our barrios and it's putting our own children at risk. So tonight to discuss this very complex and, and horrifying topic, um, we have three experts here who have been working on this issue for um, years in the community. Um, first up, I have um, Ana Isabel Vallejo, who is the co-director and attorney at Vida Legal Assistance. How are you, Ana? Good, how are you? Welcome to the Hangout. Thank you, thank you for inviting me, my pleasure. And then second, we have Rocio Alcazar. Am I saying, am I saying it right? Alcantar. Alcantar. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> Rocio Alcantar, who is a supervising attorney at the National Immigration Justice Center. How are you, Rocio? Good. Thank you, Nelene. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> and then third, we have uh, Teresita Chavez Pedrosa, my dear friend here, who is a lawyer, a journalist, and she is the past uh, president of the Hispanic National Bar Association in the Florida region. How are you, Teresita? Finally, Anne. Thank you for including me. <laughs> and so let's start with, um, let, let's do like a baseline overview of this issue. I know that this is a very complex issue, but what is human trafficking? How would you guys define it? Who wants to go first? I'm sure I'll, I'll take that, right? So the human trafficking is defined in um, U.S. law, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act of 2000 defines it um, very clearly, and it's just basically broken down into two types of trafficking, sex trafficking and labor trafficking. Sex trafficking being um, any commercial sexual act that is um, forced um, or induced, someone was, is forced into it, or it's a child that is involved in commercial sexual activity. Um, and then there's labor trafficking, which also is someone that is being forced. There's force fraud or coercion um, that induces a person into um, labor services. That's the basics <laughs> that I can tell you. Well, anybody else wants to add anything else about how you know how this manifests in the in, in the world? I just want to add that um, when we think human trafficking, we generally think of it in terms of international movement, and it doesn't necessarily require that. You can have a lot of human trafficking at the local level. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you have any statistics to share with us? You know, where where are the hubs for this kind of activity? Do you know, where, what kind of people are affected? Anything like that? I would say that from Florida, uh, we don't really have. It hubs. People mm -hmm. are coming from all over the world. Uh, people are coming from all over the United States. Uh, people are being trafficked in many industries. You have men, women, and children. And although in the United States and the media has continuously uh, portrayed human trafficking as an issue related to sex trafficking, particularly sex trafficking of children and U.S. citizen girls, uh, we have human trafficking that is happening in the labor context and in many other industries. And in Florida particularly, we have a big agricultural industry and a big uh, tourism industry uh, that benefits from uh, slave labor. Uh, our tomato fields have been affected. We've had over eight cases related to human trafficking that are labor trafficking cases. We've had cases of domestic workers that are being forced to work in homes, uh, and we have had cases of uh, folks that have been forced to work in restaurants and in hotels. Uh, so the sex industry is not the only industry, and we've had, although the majority of people in Florida are coming from Central uh, America and Mexico, we've had uh, victims from uh, South America, we've had victims from Eastern Europe, 
Um, so victims, and we've had victims from Africa. So we have victims coming from every continent in the world, and uh, folks are being forced to work in many, many, many other industries in addition to the sex industry. Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to yeah. share it a little. Uh, do you want to add to that, Rocio? I'm so sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, no, no, no. I just wanted to add, um, you know, to second what both Teresita and Ana are saying. Um, people often confuse trafficking with smuggling, and smuggling is the crossing, the illegal crossing into another their country without lawful permission. Um, and that is, if we want to simplify it, that's kind of an agreement that someone makes at the, at the beginning of their journey to the United States, let's say, um, in which they agree to be smuggled into the United States. Human trafficking sometimes is involved in, in smuggling, but we have to remember that human trafficking is when there's a violation of a person's rights, that someone is being forced into something that they did not agree to do. Huh. And I Go ahead, Teresita. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add to what Anna said um, about, you know, at the, at the more general level, getting away from the particularities that she described, when you're looking at the country and you ask what are the major hubs, um, well, traditionally it's what you expect it to be. You know, it's the major cities. It's New York, it's California, um, South Florida being number three described. Um, why is that? For, for the many other reasons that people like a location like South Florida. Anna mentioned the tourism industry, that is one. Um, the, the, the diversity, um, it, it's easier you know, for people to hide and, and the diversity in language. And obviously our status as a gateway to America um, in reference to Latin America. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I'm going to show this, um, this a, a graphic that I wanted to share with our viewers um, that shows where the main hubs are. And, and, you know, you can see there clearly that every opening, pretty much, you know, every, every kind of gateway to a different country or to a coastal area tends to be like the areas where they have, there are more incidents about, um, you know, uh, trafficking. Um, and, when we, but why is it that when we talk about this, we think that it happens somewhere else, you know? And, and how come now we're getting a lot more aware about this? Is it because there are more incidents now, or is it because um, there's more media coverage? What do you think is going on there? Well, one thing that I was going to mention, um, Eliane, is that uh, there is more awareness of the crime. Um, there's more identification as we continue to do more training, you have uh, more uh, people that are going to be able to identify some of those red flags. Uh, human trafficking is a crime that has many other crimes involved in it. It's not usually a crime that happens in and of itself. There's many other things that are going on and uh, the nature of the crime kind of hides itself under, other, uh, other, under the other types of criminal activity that are involved. Um, so folks are not necessarily, or we're not necessarily properly identifying a human trafficking case as a human trafficking case. You may have a situation uh, where you have, if, if we're going to talk about the context of uh, uh, sex trafficking, uh, you had a situation where women were being arrested for soliciting prostitution when in fact they were being forced into prostitution. Um, and in that way, you have many other similar crimes that are occurring. Uh, so I think that the training and identification has helped um, in terms of getting the word out and spreading the word and getting law enforcement uh, to identify these types of cases in the proper way. Mm -hmm. and, and, but how can this kind of thing happen all around us and, and nobody notices? What are some of the, the telltale signs, kind of, that we can... That we can, like, if we spot somebody on the street, can we say this person is a victim? How how do we identify these victims? Anyone? Well, human human trafficking is one of is you know has kind of been alluded to. It's a hidden crime, so it's hard to identify. It's just the nature of the crime. It's a hidden crime. But mm -hmm. I think um, some red flags are individuals that might not have any identity documents. Individuals that. Um, clearly are being controlled by someone else, whether that's a pimp or an employer, someone that seems to not have freedom of movement, um, someone who is working in um, below standard working conditions. I think those are some of the red flags that, that we look for um, in trying to identify victims. 
Mm-hmm. You know, some of the others that we see as well um, is the, in the foster care system, for example, we've had incidents of human trafficking, and it's, an, it's a natural fit if you think about it, because these are children who, who don't have the traditional guardians watching, and we know that the, the government is imperfect and the system doesn't see everything it should, so that's, you know, a natural place where something like human trafficking could creep in. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And what are some of the, the methods that these traffickers use to lure their victims? You know, just so we know, because I, I have a kid, I wouldn't want my child to be in that situation. Uh, whether you're talking about children who might be lured into sex trafficking or people who might be lured into any form of other trafficking, what you're looking for is a vulnerability. What the trafficker's looking for is a vulnerability to exploit. Um, normally, uh, they will look for, if you're talking about sex trafficking, you might be looking for uh, girls that may not have uh, the parental support that they need, um, or they might be complete, already isolated or not have a lot of friends or might be depressed, um, and they, they target those girls in different ways. Uh, it might show up as a, a boyfriend uh, type of scenario uh, that then later on uh, they manipulate into the girl sometimes thinks that she, or she actually is in love uh, with her trafficker. Um, and we've seen that also in the cases of adult women. Uh, so you might also be look they might also be looking for other types of vulnerability like uh, maybe single mothers uh, that or mothers that or a situation in the case of a domestic worker that I had where, uh, the trafficker was looking for somebody who had a visa to come to the United States, and this particular person had the necessity of uh, providing medical care for her daughter. Uh, and so the the offering of a better job or a better life that will be able to pay for that um, is that vulnerability that they're looking to exploit. Um, in, in other cases, we've also seen that they target people with... Um, disabilities uh, or mental health issues. We've had cases in Florida where people who are alcoholics, uh, drug addicts, uh, homeless have been uh, lured into working in the fields and then end up in a, in a situation where they're forced to work in, in enslaved conditions, in slavery-like conditions. Wow. Wow. Here's a vulnerability that perhaps you wouldn't anticipate, and it's the scariest because you know it ties into your previous question where you asked, "Where is this? Why don't we recognize it? Is it really all around us?" Mm-hmm. And um, it comes in the context of some of the websites that lure college students into relationships. You know, for example, a younger woman with a younger man. You know, in exchange for some financial benefit. Um, how does that tie into human trafficking? Well, you, when you really explore the issue and you listen to the experts they'll tell you that it's a continuum, that things like pornography, prostitution, human trafficking, at least when it comes to sexual human trafficking, you know, it's a continuum, one leads to another. So anything that traditionally lures you into one exposes you to be being lured ultimately into the traffic situation. Oh my God, and that's the scariest part because um, technology is, is, you know, it's being accused of being one of the, the main methods that these traffickers use, you know, but is, is technology really, um, it, is it helping or hindering in, in terms of getting to this, to this um, you know, stopping the trafficking? It, is it really the, the problem? What, what do you guys think? I mean, I, I, I think, think the problem is the, oh, go ahead, Rocio. <laughs> No, no, no. I, I mean, I think that uh, it, technology it can be used for good and for bad, right? That we have certainly seen cases of individuals that meet their traffickers on Facebook and, uh, you know, on dating websites and, and things of that nature. But I think, at, you know, the other side of the coin is that technology also spreads the word about this crime. And so I think it's not necessarily technology that's causing the, the problem to exploit. It's just... Um, it's just people that are, you know, this is a crime that all of a sudden people are realizing is happening and people are paying attention to it. Yeah, but it's, it also kind of facilitates it, no? Uh, I don't think technology alone. Um, I think, again, we're talking about vulnerability. Mm-hmm. And, and you have many people in third world countries that are being recruited and forced to work in other industries 
uh, where technology was not used uh, as, a, as a means to recruit and lure people into trafficking information. Uh, when we're talking about 27 million slaves, again, um, and we want to maybe focus on prostitution or the sex industry, it's, it's again not the only. We don't have 20 million slaves that are being enslaved in the sex industry alone. Uh, we, what we have is that perhaps 20% of those slaves are uh, forced to work in the sex industry. Well, where's the other 80%? And when we're talking about the other 80%, we're talking about the products that we eat, the products that we wear, the products that we drive. Um, and so in that sense, we also have to be uh, very aware of what is our complicity as consumers and as individuals. Um, in uh, wanting to purchase cheap goods that in turn lead to the need for large amounts of cheap labor uh, and then uh, this type of uh, situation occurring elsewhere and not necessarily just in the United States, although it happens here. Go for it, thought, certainly. You know, I, I think this is such a um, like you know, I, I think Teresita mentioned before how, how complex this issue is, is. Is there's so many layers to it um, that are not readily apparent. And and um, but I want to talk about one of those layers. And, and one of those layers, obviously, this is a show that has a, a focus on uh, Latino issues. And one of the the ways, you know, one of the the um, demographics that is the most affected is, is Latinos within the United States obviously we're talking about um, you know the United States in, in Latin America um, so I want uh, to ask specifically to Rocio because I know that you've been working uh, with the National Immigrant um, Justice Center um, what is the impact of human trafficking in the Latino community Let, then talk to me about you know your experience in all these years that you've been working on this yeah, I mean, I think um, similar to probably the work that Anna and, and her organization do, we serve um, immigrants, immigrant survivors of human trafficking. And I think um, going to something that Anna also mentioned, the vulnerability, immigrants in general are very vulnerable because um, they are seeking to come to this country to work and better their lives for themselves and their family, and sometimes at the cost of doing whatever needs to get done in order to have that paycheck without realizing that sometimes that is going to be used and, and um, employers are going to uh, use that against them and exploit them and, and, and not pay them and, and other issues that come with that. So I think, in my experience, um, human trafficking is related to the Latino community is the, is the fact that a lot of uh, Latinos are, are immigrants to this country, either recent arrivals or, or kind of um, newer immigrants that are still you know, low income and in those vulnerability groups. I also um, I work at the National Immigrant Justice Center specifically with the Immigrant Children's Protection Project and so we see a handful of kids that are coming from Central America and, and Mexico and other countries that um, are facing um, human trafficking on their journey north and again sometimes on their journey they're meeting traffickers or sometimes from their home countries they're encountering someone that promises them the world when they get to the United States and, and then they end up here in the United States and they're either forced into a commercial sex industry or forced into a labor situation or they feel like now they're indebted to this person who um, paid for their smuggling fees um, but it means that they're gonna have to work in a restaurant for the next you know 20 30 years um, without getting any wages which is a serious problem Wow, wow, and, and especially now we, we, you know, it kind of was brought to light um, in, in terms of, you know, the, the situation that is going on at the, bar, at the border with the influx of children on accompanied mi minors um, into the country. So why do you think that these children and, and Latino immigrants in general, why do you think they're so vulnerable to this? Is it, is it the, the, uh, the laws, the regulations, uh, the, the enforcement policies of the United States that, that facilitate this kind of uh, traffic, or what is it? I mean, I think, I think in part um, immigrants are, are very afraid to come forward and report injustices. Um, they're afraid to report crimes to the police, to law enforcement, because particularly if they're in this country um, as an undocumented individual or if they cross the country without lawful status, um, 
they're afraid that the moment that they speak out, um, instead of being helped or instead of um, the trafficker being accused, that they would be the ones accused and, and deported. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, those are the conversations that we often have with the clients, trying to reassure them that if they do come forward um, and report the crime, that there is relief available for them. And, and that relief can, can lead to a permanent status here in the United States. Um, so, and, and the importance of, of reemphasizing to them that um, this is a crime, regardless of what immigration status you have, someone cannot force you into something that you don't agree to, basically. Mm -hmm. I think also to add a little bit to that, um, we have to remember that uh, Latino immigrants that are coming into the United States are usually fleeing either uh, really bad uh, criminal conditions in their home countries or in their home cities. Um, they're also fleeing uh, extreme poverty. Um, and those are already uh, situations that make them vulnerable. But they're also coming from uh, places where the government is very corrupt. And so accessing uh, the authorities here is, is going to be a little bit harder for them because there is such a huge mistrust of the authorities in their home countries already. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Teresita, you want to add something? Yeah, I, I wanted to elaborate on something Rocio said. Um, so, so the government, um, especially the federal government, to a lesser extent, at least in Florida, the, the state government, realized that the problem isn't so much, well, I mean, it's not the people, but it's the, it's the heads of these organizations. So they put laws in place where they, who they're really trying to get to are the people that run these organizations. And that's where the, the benefits, um, immigration and otherwise, to the victims are available if the victims come forward. Um, another thing that I learned about a year or so ago is some of the consulates of these countries, for example, the Mexican consulate here in Miami um, would help their nationals. You know, if the national somehow could get to the consulate, they don't necessarily want to go straight to the American authorities. Um, the, the, the organization here will help, even in, in some cases, to cover the legal expenses of the national that, that is in trouble and, and needs the help. That's awesome to know. That that's a great and and if you have any more information on that, um, Teresita, I can put it on my website as a resource for people who, who um, are going to be watching this afterwards. Um, but uh, in, let's talk about a little bit about the legislation um, aspect of it. I, is there any are there any protections for these victims? Is there anything being done in in terms of legislation to protect and and to also to crack down on the perpetrators of this crime. Do you do you know? Well, as uh, Rocio mentioned uh, before, the Victims of Trafficking Protection Act uh, enhanced uh, penalties, and uh, that uh, act has been reauthorized uh, in 2003, 2005, 2008, uh, 2011, um, and each year uh, what we see is that the government uh, facilitates the process of, uh, of the main goals of the uh, Victims of Trafficking Protection Act, which is one, uh, to enhance penalties, to create a new crime, enhance penalty and enhance penalties against traffickers, ensure that there are more prosecutions and uh, investigations are easier, uh, for, uh, particularly for immigrant victims, uh, there have been a uh, creation of uh, immigration benefits and mechanisms to provide for te protection uh, from deportation um, and to provide quick access to uh, a work permit and a, pr and a parole t or what they call continued presence so that the victim may remain in the United States uh, while there is an investigation pending in addition to the creation of several visas that address um, uh, be immigration benefits for victims of violent crimes, including a T visa, which is particular for victims of trafficking, and a U visa, which is uh, particular for victims of mu a much broader uh, category of violent crimes. Um, in addition, the government has also uh, passed uh, some other mechanisms in which family members who are being uh, threatened in the home country can come into the United States prior to the creation of a visa under an advanced parole mechanism so that they can also be protected here in the United States. Wow, and this is information that nobody knows about. So uh, what, what can, you know, what kind of, um, where can people go to find out about this, you know, what are the resources out there 
um, you know, and, and feel free to talk about the work that your own organizations are doing because I know you're doing a lot of things to help these victims. Um, let me chime in here to say two things, too. Um, so, can, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> go ahead, okay. go ahead. Um, so, so I just wanted to say, um, as far as, as legislation and, and laws are concerned, I think states at the state level, there's a lot of um, there are a lot of laws that could be positive and and, and could and be expanded to other to other states. Here in Illinois, for instance, um, it, just in 2010, a law was finally passed to say that um, individuals' children that in that are in um, in prostitution, involved in prostitution, shouldn't be charged with the crime of prostitution. So that was a huge victory for us mm -hmm. here in Illinois because children can't consent to having sex. So it, it was really, you know, silly to have a child charged as a prostitute and clearly they're they're underage, they can't consent to this, they're being forced into this life. And so those kinds of laws are really impacting our community. Um, there's other laws that are passing, I think, throughout the state that enable victims to access social services a lot sooner than maybe um, the government, the federal government um, uh, issues those that continue presence and, and, and other uh, benefits at the federal level. So sometimes those are, are very necessary because when a victim um, is fortunate enough to escape the trafficker, they're in so much need of, of a lot of things, and, and, you know, including or mainly, I guess, at times, the social services, housing, um, food, shelter, the basics. And so um, there's, uh, I know California, I think, passed a law not too long ago that enables uh, social service agencies to provide services to victims so long as an attorney has declared them, um, fitting into the definition of being a, a victim of human trafficking. So that's really important. And as far as resources, just quick, there is um, the national hotline that is run by the Polaris Project in D.C. that um, if someone is in need of services, they calling the hotline um, connects individuals to services around the country, so that's a good resource. Um, I don't have the the number off the top of my head, but if you Google Polaris Project, um, it'll pop up and and give you kind of uh, resources there, and then the hotline number. Yeah, and I, I believe the website for that is polarisproject.org. So, and um, or you just simply Google it. I think that's the easiest way. For human trafficking. I I didn't hear that, Anisada. Yeah. It's the National Resource Center for Human Trafficking mm -hmm. uh, .org. I believe that the, that's the, the whole title of the organization. Okay. Um, and it's run by Polaris Project, so there's two ways of getting to that website. Um, I think also I'd like to mention that the Freedom Network USA uh, .org has a lot of resources available on human trafficking. It has a, a lot of other organizations that are working on the issue throughout the United States. Um, as well as uh, St. Thomas University School of Law has a Human Trafficking Academy. It's going to be going on from July 28th until August 1st uh, for this summer academy, but their website also has a lot of resources, not only at the national level, but at the international level, and that website is humantraffickingacademy.org. Nice. And Teresita, do you want to add to that? Well, um, I, I just wanted to add to what Rocio said and mention that just yesterday in Florida, um, there were there were some bills signed into law that uh, that provide um, additional protections to to victims of trafficking. And then at the federal level, what we see, for example, and this is not so much um, something that a victim would would avail themselves of, but the government is definitely putting in place to curb this activity. Um, we see aggra aggravating sentences. Basically, the more the the more vulnerable the victim is. What does that mean? That means that if you are trafficking a child versus an adult, your penalties are going to be much harsher to make it a bigger deterrent. Great. That's that's good. <laughs> Hit them hard. <laughs> Yeah. Go ahead. One more thing that I'd like to mention, um, the State Department will ha be having its, uh, they have a, a report that they issue every year on the, on the topic of human trafficking and what's happening in the rest of the world, including the United States in terms of protection, legislation, and prosecution. Um, and they will be issuing the 2014 report uh, on Friday. So that's another resource that you may want to check out is the State Department's website um, and the Department of Justice website. I will make sure that I list all of those resources on my website. Um, I know also, Teresita, that you are yeah. holding an event in Florida. Um, yeah. Do you well, want to talk about that? 
We're, we're doing two things. Anna mentioned St. Thomas University's Human Trafficking Academy, and that will be going on. That's a week-long training to recognize um, a possible signs that somebody's being trafficked, um, how you should respond at, as a first responder, how you can work with other organizations, and things of that sort. Um, however, the Friday before that academy starts, which is on July 25th, also at St. Thomas University, but free of charge, um, the Hispanic National Bar is holding their third annual human trafficking conference. And thank you, thank you so much for putting that. Um, and we're going to have a, a, a panel of fantastic experts talking about this issue. And we've been told uh, that that the best thing we can do is educate, and that's what we're doing. And and thank you, Eliane, for putting together a Google Hangout like this so that we could continue to do so. No, my pleasure. I think this is this is a, a topic that it's really under our noses, but nobody talks about, and and it you know it affects so much. Um, actually, the the reason I I came into you know being aware of all of this is because my daughter wrote a paper for university, and um, you know I usually see her papers, and you know sometimes I I help her just to give her my my point of view, but in reading the paper, um, I, I saw the statistics for Washington, D.C., which is, you know, right next door to where we live, and to, to Maryland, which is where, where we live, and, and it really it really is scary, and, uh, you know, I would have never thought that this is happening so close to home, you know, I, you, you listen to, to news about, you know, oh, this is happening in Africa, it's happening, you know, maybe at the border, but not in your own town, you know, uh, and so I um, I want to give you guys the, the opportunity to um, to give a call to action to the people who are watching. I know we're running into um, 7.40 almost, uh, so that's uh, 10 more minutes than you signed up for, but I, I really do want, um, if you had to say to people, you know, this one thing that you want them to do, how can we all help to combat human trafficking in our own communities? Who wants to go first? I would say um, continue to explore opportunities like this to get educated, to further learn how to recognize it. And then on behalf of children in particular, I would say um, keep an eye on them. Keep an eye on children around you. Keep an eye on your own children because you're right. It happens right under your nose and there's nobody that is completely safe. Mm -hmm. Anna or, or Jose? <laughs> you guys are too polite. Go ahead. <laughs> but I'll go. I'll go. I would uh, say, in addition to continuing becoming involved, uh, try to find out what organizations are working on the issue of human trafficking, and try to find out how you can uh, start combating human trafficking from a much broader perspective than the sex trafficking uh, perspective. Uh, again, this is happening in our service industries, it's happening in the products industries. If we start demanding that companies uh, are more transparent in where their supplies are, uh, then when, when we are buying products, we make sure that we are also not being complicit in, in human trafficking by buying cheap products that are being produced uh, or our food that it's being uh, brought to us that we're putting on the table uh, through the threat of somebody who's being uh, enslaved. Mm -hmm. And um, And I would also just add that um, it's important, as, as Teresita was saying, to get educated and, and get involved. I would actually discourage people from trying to rescue people. You know, it's a complicated crime and, and you don't want to get yourself into a, a you know, a dangerous situation. So I would say get educated, volunteer for organizations that are working on this. You know, everyone has special skills, so make sure that you um, provide those skills to um, established organizations already. And then, of course, donate if you can donate financially to organizations that are doing this kind of work. Um, there's definitely a, a lot of need um, in social services and legal services for these victims. And, and I'm, I'm going to... Um to say I, I don't usually give my own call to action, but um, I want to, to add to what Anna was saying before. Uh, there is an app actually that that uh, is called Bicot, and you can find out 
um, you know, which com companies are sustainable, which ones are fair, mm -hmm. you know, to, to their providers, which ones, are, you know, do fair trade and things of that nature, and which ones don't, so that you can boycott them. And it's called boycott. And, and you just reminded my, me to to um, of the name of that of the app. Uh, so you know, if you have a, a a phone, it's very easy to download. It's free, and it, it tells you all you need to know about you know companies that do um, fair practices. Um, I also want you to visit the websites of these organizations that that these amazing ladies are involved with. Um, you know, Vida Legal Assistance. Uh, Anna, what is the website for your for your organization? Vidalaw.org. Mm -hmm. And Rocio is with the National Immigrant Justice Center. What is the website, Rocio? Um, we're www.immigrantjustice.org. Perfect. And and uh, Teresita, what is the website for HNBA, but also you know the, you're involved in so many things. <laughs> I, I am with the Hispanic National Bar Association and with St. Thomas University School of Law in Miami. I think the St. Thomas is stu.edu and HMBA um, is www.hmba.com. Perfect. And I want to thank you all so much, Ana, Rocio, Teresita, for taking this time to, to really enlighten us about this issue. This is something that, you know, I just recently kind of uh, became aware of, uh, and I had heard about it before, but never gave it any thought until recently. Thank you so much for, for educating us on this topic. I'm going to be listing all of the resources that they uh, mentioned in my website, and you're going to be able to watch this Hangout again on my YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash user slash Elian Ramos. And um, I want to thank you all for watching. I want to thank these amazing ladies again. Uh, and I hope you all have a great night. I see you next week, same time and same channel. Thank you. <laughs> great. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye.